Welcome to the Chasing a Repose video, which we finally got done. And there's a reason behind that, because we've been very, very busy little people. Um, we now have, um, what do we have? We, we have a full length feature video now featuring this riveted portrait pendant. Um, and I'm going to show you how to make that and this really cool um, forged link chain. And another little thing we've done is we've put together a newsletter called In the Studio with Nancy, or as I like to call it, In the Studio with the Old Bag. Um, and I'm going to have lots of tips and tricks, and we're going to have articles, not juggling tricks, but, you know, jewelry making. And we're going to have lots of articles and news and new jewelry that I do will be posted there. So if you subscribe to this newsletter, you will get 15% off of the Riveted Portrait Pendant um, video. And I'm not done. You'll enter in a drawing to win this necklace, the uh, palm wood necklace. It has a uh, Anastasia topaz and a petrified palm wood cabochon with sterling and copper. So lots of really cool stuff. We've been really busy. I have not been laying on the couch watching soap operas, okay? So let's get started with the video and uh, hopefully it won't take five hours. <laughs> okay, see you in a minute. So the first thing we need to do is discuss what chasing and repousse are. Um, chasing is basically uh, making marks on the front side of the metal, whereas repousse is pushing the metal from behind, creating volume in the piece. Um, you can work the chasing alone or the repose loan, or you can work them together, and you can also combine it with engraving and other uh, jewelry making techniques. Before we start this, I do want to warn you that I am not a master of this, and um, there are masters, and here's one of them, and this, I think everybody should get this book, Chasing a Repose Methods Ancient and Modern with Megan Corwin, and it's a really awesome book, so I highly recommend it, and I'll have a link to it um, on the video. So we're going to show you different examples of what is chased and what is repose. So this piece was done strictly with repose. You can see how it's pushed up from back, the back. It's a very soft looking technique. There aren't a lot of sharp edges on it. Um, and so that's repose. This is also repose. I actually used the hydraulic press and then punched out the shapes a little more. Um, to make them more organic looking. And then this little whoopee, which I haven't done anything with yet, is right at this point only repousséed um, where the metal is pushed out from behind. Um, I generally don't do a lot of just chasing or just repousé, but I probably do less chasing. But this piece is, stri is strictly chasing. There's no repousé. And you can see the little uh, marks made with the chasing tools. Um, so it's kind of like almost like a little engraved look. Then we have these are a combination of elements. These are this was a practice piece here on raising up the metal pretty high, and this is done with repose and chasing. I'll show you the back. Um, those are you can see the tool marks there. Same with this leaf. This is both chased and repose and um, then sawn out. And then this is like some finished stuff that has a combination. This is, has very little rep, uh, chasing, but I chase the center line to set the uh, silver wire into. So this is barely chased. And then this, these earrings are both chased and repousséed. So um, those are some examples of what we're going to be talking about and some of the things we're going to be going over in our fabulous video today. So... We need to talk about the tools that are involved in chasing a repose. And one of the most important tools is something called pitch, which is either a pine resin or resin based or a petroleum based kind of tarry substance that's both yielding but firm enough to be able to do the hard chase lines. Um, the, um, either the resin or the petroleum product is mixed with either brick dust or plaster of Paris or tallow or wax, depending on, on uh, the hardness of the pitch. And the pitch comes basically in a hard, medium, and a soft. And you can mix your own together to get the right consistency, consistency 
<laughs> for what you are going to work on. So this bowl is not filled enough down here. This is a red pitch and it's a medium use pitch. Um, I just bought this um, pitch and I didn't buy enough. So this is a pretty big bowl and I wanted to have a bigger bowl for bigger pieces. So normally you would fill this to the top and actually have a little bow on it. Um, I probably have kaffir in it, which is traditional for me with my metal clay work and anything that comes in contact because of that over there. So um, if you see it in my jewelry, just know it's, it's an original Nancy Hamilton. <laughs> So then we have, this is the tar, this, sorry, this is the, the resin based, you know, the, the natural based. Uh, and then this is a petroleum, which is probably natural too in a way, but it's stinkier. Um, there, this one is a lot stickier than this, you know, just when they're um, not soft. And you have to heat this pitch up before you work in it, otherwise you can't get your um, anchors into this. And we'll talk about all this later. So for heating um, the pitch up, you can use either a heat gun or a really big uh, brushy flame on a torch. Um, and I will show you how to do that because using the torch can num number one, be dangerous, and number two, you can ruin your pitch by overheating it and catching it on fire. Um, one note on safety on this, it is a lung and an eye irritant. So if you're going to be um, burning off the pitch to clean your piece or you are just warming it, you should have some sort of ventilation or do it outside. Bring Get a big old extension cord out into the front yard with your heat gun. <laughs> so I just wanted to show you a little bit about the composition. Uh, you need a base. Oh my God, the world is falling apart. So generally they come with these rubber things. You can also buy a felt. I don't have felt one. This is another rubber holder. And these are for so that you can take these balls and move them at different angles. Um, this cast iron ball is nice because they're really heavy um, and they don't fly around and they handle the stress of uh, the hammering that is involved in chasing a repose. Um, you can use an old thick belt that you roll up into a ring and, and rip or rivet or clamp together somehow which is actually what I did when I first started. And this, I'm gonna, I brought this to show you my first pitch ball because I didn't have any money at all and hardly any tools. So I had this little tin and I went, oh, I like the shape, I could put this into a belt. So this is what was my original pitch ball, was a top to a, what the heck was this? A toffee, cream toffees, ew. I don't know, somebody must have given me that for Christmas and I threw them out and kept the, the container. So. You also need um, dedicated like spatulas or big spoons. You need to have like pitch tools because this stuff is messy. This is a very, very messy process um, sometimes. Um, you can also make your own pitch. It's dangerous um, and there's it's a bigger mess than just warming the pitch up. So um, I don't recommend it. There's so many great pitch suppliers out there now. There's a green pitch, red pitch, and this black pitch, and there's all different variations within it. So I'll have links so you can go check it out and see which one you want. Uh, medium is a good one, starting pitch, the uh, medium softness. It'll cover most of your needs. So that's the very basics on pitch. I'll have, like I said, more on my website. So we're going to talk next about chasing tools. Chasing tools are the paintbrush of chasing a repose. Um, they're going to transfer what's on their surface to your metal. And there's a bunch of different kinds. There's liners and there's the punches and there's, um, oh my God, I can't remember half the names because I am so senile. So we have undercutting tools and running punches and matting tools and textured tools and stamps. And I'll talk about all those as we use some of them. And I probably won't discuss all of them anyway because this video will be five hours long and I don't want to do that to you. But um, basically, when you do Chasing Your Repose, at one point you're probably going to want to make your own tools. So we're going to do a separate video on how to make your own Chasing Your Repose tools. Not in this video. Uh, if you buy commercial tools, you have to be very careful because 
well, you don't have to be careful, but you need to be aware that when some of the tools come from the manufacturer, they aren't finished. Um, like, I don't know if we'll have a close-up of these, but this one in particular, you can really see the sharp edges on here, and they need to be rounded down. Um, if you have a sharp edge like this, it's going to tear the metal, it's going to get stuck. And the concept behind chasing repose tools is that they glide across the metal instead of getting whammed in, you know, stuck in there. You don't want stuck. So um, finishing them, I'll show you how to do that later on too. So I just want to briefly cover things right now to give you a warm up and an idea of what we're talking about. Um, these, these are uh, nail sets and they are also great for making little circles. And I think I got these at Senora Harbor Freight. And they're from Pittsburgh, and they're a three-piece nail punch set. Um, and they're great for cat fur, I bet. <laughs> they're great for making little circles, because this is really hard to do with a liner. Let me show you a liner. Where are my liners? A liner is basically what it sounds like. It makes a line. It's your drawing tool, and um, we will be demonstrating the use of a liner in a minute also. But that's a liner. And these are repose tools. They're more rounded, softer edge tools. This is for undercutting and shaping sides and punching down metal and these are kind of like for a bunch of different stuff. You can also use dapping punches which I still do. I mean there's some nice little tiny circles uh, for pushing the metal out. Uh, this, these would be used in repose because see they don't have the sharp edges on them, they're rounder. Um, and there's, there's, you could, there's so many things you can make hammers that are used in this that have little patterns on it. There's just so much you can do. It really is a very, very creative sport. <laughs> so um, that's all we're going to talk about on chasing tools right now and repose tools right now. And I'm going to talk briefly about hammers and image design transfer. Chasing hammers have a very large face, as you can see on here. The concept behind these large faces is that when you're working, you don't um, have to really focus and look at the surface area where they're going to hit like this. And this big head will, you're going to hit it somewhere because it's so large. So that's the concept behind these uh, larger faces on here. Now, these are the my new babies that I love so much. They're the Fretz Hammers, F-R-E-T-Z. And I think they're like... I think I got these for $53 from Auto Fry. Um, they're beautifully made hammers. I absolutely love them. But this one I think was like 12 bucks, and I've had for 15 years and it works great. So what you want in, in a hammer is you want a nice springy, relatively light hammer because you're going to get used, it, you're doing this a lot and you're going to end up with a lot of fatigue in your arm if your hammer is too heavy. You also want it to spring back from the tool so you create this kind of rhythm, uh, very zen, very zen uh, technique in chasing repose. I absolutely adore it. It's my favorite one. Um, so that's it. You want light and springy. You want a nice head on it. Um, you do wreck the heck out of these. I mean, these came in, they were so pretty and shiny, and then I used them, and now they look like crap. But that's what it is. Um, there's two schools of thought on the, the curved or flat faces. I don't know if you can see the difference here. This one is slightly curved and this is flat. That's a personal choice. Some people like flat face. Some like a little curved. Some also say, oh, who are these people? <laughs> some also say that a round face may slip off the tool easier. Um, but I haven't noticed, at least with this one, any, any issues with it. This smaller one, this is a me these two are medium weight hammers. Um, the smaller one I'll, I'll be using for more f tinier, more fine detailed work where I don't want a heavy hammer to maybe when I'm getting to the end and the metal's getting thin, I don't want to punch through it. So, um, that's it on hammers and, uh, oh, except for you need to wear your goggles every time you pick up a hammer. Flying pitch, flying cat fur, <laughs> flying metal, just protect yourself. So next thing is we're going to transfer, um, images to the metal. Um, so you first off need an image and I would start with simple shapes. Um, a leaf is a nice one or, or a circle or a square. Just something simple for practicing. Um, 
and I've got this book uh, called Plants by Jim Harder, and it's a really awesome uh, book. It's filled with black and white images of plants. I mean, tons and tons of leaves and flowers and stuff like that. So when you begin chasing a repose, um, I recommend copper because copper doesn't need to be annealed as much as other metals. Um, uh, other me excellent metals to work with are, are argentium, silver, sterling silver, which is a little tougher. Fine silver is great because it's a softer metal. Um, bronzes and brasses, you can definitely do chase and repose with them. They're just a little harder. They're more in the um, sterling silver range. And you can actually do it with steel, but that's a whole other process, so we're not even going to talk about that. I'll have I have a bunch of uh, information on metals on my on my website that you can look at. Um, so what you want is a, I would start with the copper, as I said, and it needs to be clean and annealed. So you want if you're going to buy it, buy a dead soft uh, metal. And I'm using 22 gauge, which is fine for chasing a repose. Um, if you're going to be doing really, really high raised images, you want to use a slightly thicker gauge, maybe a 20 gauge or something. You can chase with a 24, you can, you know, whatever you want. It's The thicker it is, the harder it is to move the metal. Just think of it that way. Uh, but if you're making a vessel or something, you're definitely going to start with something of a, of a thicker gauge. So here's our 22. And this white stuff on here is China White, which is a water-based paint substance. Um, the reason that you paint on there, you can use gouache or um, probably even white watercolor that comes in a tube, some kind of water base so you can wash, so it'll wash off, is that your design's going to show up better. And this is the method that I use for transferring images. So I found this fabulous little ginkgo leaf. And what I'm going to do is take it, make sh and this is a uh, ye old, um, what the heck is this stuff called? Used to use it with typing paper. Oh, I'm having a senior moment again. Tracing? No, not tracing. Tracing paper? No, not tracing paper. So I finally remembered the word. It's carbon paper. Um, I haven't used it in so long. <laughs> I forgot that. Well, I use it in this, but not for typing. For you youngsters, it used to be to tra make two copies when you typed on a typewriter. So anyway. This is my fabulous little ginkgo leaf that I drew, I traced directly out of the book. And then I've got my carbon paper, and, I, and don't do what I did about 10 minutes ago. Make sure that the, the carbony part is facing on top of the metal, not the other way. Otherwise, you get nothing. So um, just make a little pack like this. When you set your design up, you want to um, pull that out of there and give you an idea. You want to leave, oh, I don't know, half an inch all the way around the piece you don't want to put that drawing too near the edge here it'll be very hard to work this area not impossible but very hard and very annoying so i'm just going to make this little package and then grab some fabulous everything's fabulous today i must be in a good mood fabulous just going to make a little package here and this is just so that the um stuff the paper it has an actual word besides stuff doesn't move while I'm doing my transfer. And then I usually just take a ballpoint pen and push kind of hard because that way you're, what you're ending up doing is just making a little, uh, what do you call it, groove, a very faint groove for the chasing tool to sit in. So I'm just going to go around and trace all my lines like that. Um, I'm not going to do this whole thing. Boring. Not fabulous. So what you'll end up with is, you know, this kind of blue line, this kind of blue line. <laughs> but um, I always go over it with marker, uh, the Sharpie, so it's less apt to wear off. Because this is, I think it's wax based and it smears. So um, I'll go, either go over it with a, a Sharpie marker or use a scribe and scribe the line in. Some, something that is going to be a little more permanent. This this seems to work really well for me at this point, so I'm going to stick with it, you know. And then another little thing you got to do is grab some pliers and bend your corners down. And what this is going to do is be an anchor in the pitch. Then, so this will sit in, and every time I, so this will be the chase part. We'll chase the line here so that on the back side we'll be able to see the image. 
and on the front, and it won't matter if the drawing's here anymore. Now, some people stick this directly in the pitch, which is really messy, and I don't like it. Um, I like to put something on the back side of this so that I don't, when I pull this up, it's just not globbed with pitch, because I always burn it off because I'm lazy. Um, some people use mineral, heat it up and use mineral oil and wipe it off. That's another method, or just heat it and wipe it. Um, then you end up with stacks of paper towels, which smoke, paper towels, I don't know, which is ecologically worse. But um, there are two things you can do uh, to coat the back. This is like a lip balm, and you can put this all over the back of the piece. Rub it up under here, too. Or you can use, um, I've used olive oil a lot, but this is, um, this, what the heck is this called? Mineral oil uh, is, an, uh, is very close to the composition of the pitch. So people recommend using mineral oil on the back of this. And you just put a little bit and rub it around. You don't want to have excess on there. So that'll, that's where we are. We're at prep for starting our lining at this point. So we've got some kind of lubricant on the back. We've got our image on here pretty firmly. And then what we're going to do next is go in and get the pitch ready to stick our uh, metal into. Come on.